Hey coach, so glad you found us on YouTube. Um, I have been coaching for 30 years, so I know how many great resources there are out there. I, I tried to bring them together at teachhoops.com. Let me help you become a better basketball coach. All sorts of great resources on there. And even the best part is the community, the one-on-one -on -one calls with me, office hours, you name it. You know, I've been there. You can see behind all the balls. You can see a couple of my players have played in the NBA. I am here to help. I am here to serve. So go over and check it out. Click above, down below, teachhoops.com. Enjoy the video. All right, welcome to Coach Unplugged. So I've, I've been telling all the coaches that have been on in the last month, I'm not sure when yours is going to go up, Coach. Um, th this, this COVID thing has allowed me to get a lot of interviews. <laughs> so I've been busy, which is good. Uh, but it's going to allow me to get a lot of in, uh, interviews. So um, I'm going to, Coach, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Um, uh, tell us who you are. Tell us kind of your basketball journey. Um, I, it's a very intriguing to me. So I have lots of questions. It's, um, we're doing this right now on a Sunday at 7, 19 AM where I am. What time is it where you are? It's, uh, 2, 19, 2, 19. Yeah. So that's crazy to me anyway. Uh, so it's good. I'm glad it worked out as far as getting, I thought, I, I thought it was later than that. That's perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, so go ahead, coach, introduce yourself, kind of tell your, and I want you to go through your basketball journey, kind of tell us, you know, don't go back to when I was two years old playing at the playground, but kind of go back if, if you played and, and how we got to the point where we're sitting here talking right now. So okay. I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, my name is Nabil Murad. Um, I'm originally from Ireland. Um, I grew up there and that's kind of where I started my coaching career. Uh, it started as a result of me starting to play basketball at about 17, 18, and not really being at the level that I needed to be to make any team. So as a result, um, we kind of set up our own team, and inevitably I ended up being a player coach, which was not fun because I knew nothing about the sport other than watching Coach Carter and Glory Road. So um, all I knew was to the baseline. Um, good, good movies, good movies. Those are yeah, bad, those really are good. Not bad starting point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, as as I I guess progressed there, I wanted to become a better coach and I wanted to become a little bit more knowledgeable, especially working with people that you know um, knew more about the sport than me. So all my all the players I was coaching knew more, and uh, as a result, I guess from not having a young basketball background, I saw the game a little bit differently. And I'm not sure if that's exactly it, but I felt like I got a lot of opportunities uh, to progress quite rapidly. Um, I ended up coaching media's basketball at the Women's Super League, which is the highest league in women's basketball in Ireland. And then I got an opportunity to coach as an assistant coach with the Irish under 16 national team. And just one thing led to another. Um, you know, uh, the year after I finished with the Irish national team, I managed to get an uh, opportunity to coach at Bishop O'Connell High School in Washington, D.C., which was great. Oh, I mean, uh, that's one of the – oh, yeah. So who are you under at Bishop O'Connell? Oh, uh, Coach Joe Wooten, fantastic yeah. coach. And I got and a lot when, of chance And, to when, and when were you – and what were the years that you were coaching there? 2013, 2015. Mellow Trimble. So we uh, beat you. I, oh, my God, I coached against you, Coach. What a small world. Who are you coaching? I coach you at Madison Memorial. We beat you in the uh, uh, beach ball classic. Oh, my God. That, that is a small world. Isn't that a small world? Yeah, coach that's, was that's not happy. Amazing. His wife was definitely not happy. With me. Sorry, <laughs> Coach Wooten. No, <laughs> no, it's good. Um, yeah, Coach Wooten, Terrellin, I mean, great people. and Yeah, we put up. Uh, so, here, so okay, so let's talk about bird walking. We talked about bird walking before we started. But anyway, uh, so what a small world that's oh my gosh anyway so I, that was a good we sh, god we should have won in that semis too anyway um <laughs> we put i put Darius fountain on trimble and he did it and now you, he Darius is an mm -hmm. nfl football player so that's about all that could stop trimble to be honest with you but um oh yeah we had oh man i had i think i had two d i mean i, I daryl and i had Sharif. I, I had a little point guard i had uh sharif and i had a uh, Daryl, big guy, and they both played D. Well, yeah, well, that was a great game. That was a great game. That was a big win yeah. for us. Yeah, you're bringing back memories that are that are good for you right now. 
and not so much for, for me right now. Um, Coach was not but, happy, too. I just remember him not being like, who are these people from Wisconsin? What are you doing? <laughs> like, we, got, we can hoop. We can hoop. And Trimble yeah. was, yeah. We, we basically spent 24 hours figuring out how to stop him. And we, okay. that was, that was our, we just, were going to stop him. We were going to make other people beat us. And we did a pretty okay. good job. And when you put a six, four wide receiver NFL athlete on him, it was harder for him to score. Cause you know, um, yeah. Oh, wow. What a small world. Well, yeah. Mellow Trimble, great talent. Um, like, yeah, it was, it was great. Where's he doing now? What's he doing now? Is he playing overseas? Um, last I heard he signed a contract overseas, I think somewhere in Europe. I'm okay. not. 100 percent sure of where he's yeah. at right now but i think yeah. it's somewhere in europe yeah and um, yeah great wow okay go I ahead i'm sorry that, 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 <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean, i didn't mean to bring up bad war wounds i'm sorry <laughs> no you're good <laughs> um so yeah uh finishing up at bishop o'connell i came back to ireland and i got the chance to be the head coach of the irish under 16 men's national team competed at the european championships which was great experience again just meeting a lot of great like-minded coaches and then I went to the UK and I coached at Leicester uh, Basketball Club, Charnwood College Academy. So I spent a season there working with the youth side and um, being the sports psychologist and the youth coach. Um, from there, I came back to Ireland, finished my master's in sports, management, uh, sports, uh, sports and exercise psychology. And then I got an opportunity to come out here to Austria and coach at Munden Swans. And I'm now the youth coordinator, youth development coach here uh, at Swans. So this is me going into my third year. So, I mean, that's me kind of running through the different, I guess, journey. But, yeah, that's, it, it's, been, it's been a great experience. It's been a great journey for me. And I think I'm just getting started. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's so. Uh, what's, the, what's the plans moving forward? Um, at the moment, well, get past COVID, yes. but um, we've kind of we've kind of laid out how we want to, you know. So the the club over here has in the last ten years dropped down in terms of youth development. So our plan is over the next ten years to build this back up to where we need to be. We want to develop our own players. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the club structure in Europe, but uh, yeah. So we want to develop our own players to come up through our pathway and go into our pro team. Right. which obviously will help financially and we don't need to rely on bringing imports all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're doing, it, we're, doing, we're doing the right things now to get there, but it is going to be a process and it's going to take us some time to get there. The oh, end. it's a long, that's a, it's like building a program anywhere. It's a long-term process, especially. If, 100%. Yeah, you yeah. got to, cause you got to start. <laughs> yeah. You want to build your own, building your own are the best, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It, it makes sense. Cause you know, that's like, and it's no disrespect to anybody you, you can get a lot of different uh, mentalities, different uh, points of views, and you, you can get people to contribute coming from abroad. But at the same time, if we're talking about being consistent and sustainable, you got to develop from within. And obviously then that will help basketball in Europe, basketball in Austria, so on and so forth. Right. And the thing is, um, the, the, like you said, the, the new world, that might not be people. I mean, I can't even go to Canada if I want to go to Canada. So let alone Austria. I mean, I, right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's maybe it's forcing your hand a little bit too. It's like you, people aren't going to be getting people in anybody. So a little bit. And, and just, just to add on that, we actually had four professionals last season, but looking at this season, we're only going to bring in uh, well four professional. I mean, four guys who came in from abroad and right. looking at this season, we're just bringing in one guy. Um, and just to add with the COVID, I guess the change, one of the other changes is happening is that if you're a versatile player, all of a sudden your stock's gone up. Right. We can't afford to bring in one specialist. We got to bring right. in a multi versatile, yeah. exactly. So um, yeah. So you can that tell means you can tell. Okay, so that that's talk about. So you can tell you're in Europe because your ambulances sound different than our ambulances. No, yeah, I love that. So loud. I always it's so loud. Love, they are so loud, but they're but it's a different. Like everybody that's listening in in North America knows that that's in. I mean, they're just different sounds. It's crazy. It's like. It makes me think of London, to be honest with you, or times okay. when I've traveled. It's like it's a, it's not a bad. I mean, it's a bad noise for somebody because it's going somewhere. Yeah. But for yeah. for when you're when when you're from the from North America, when you go into Europe, that sounds just like that sound brings back good memories like for me because okay. it's like <laughs> you no, know, it's like because I, rem I remember I spent like um I spent the after my first year teaching I spent there it goes again I spent um and I don't edit this so we just leave it I don't care. 
uh, we, um, I spent the first summer after my first year teaching with my brother backpacking around Europe. It was the best thing ever. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, it was so much fun. We had so much fun. Uh, we were going to bring, I was actually going to bring my kids this, this summer, actually, but the world ended. So then we have to postpone it for a while. All right. So why don't we go through your, uh, why don't we go through, can you share your screen coach and we'll go through your thing. And then I've got tons of, I don't have as many European questions because I think I figure out the club system now. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, right. Okay. I'm just going to go through this, but now I'm not like going to go through the full thing. So I guess you got to tell me, um, yeah, we'll just talk about, we'll talk about whatever you, whatever road we need to go down and then we can okay. share it with people and awesome. I'll put so, your, con I'll I put your contact stuff too. And then, they have questions they can get a hold of you good you have your website awesome. in the bottom that's perfect okay so i guess i guess i mean one of the things you you know we were discussing before i came on was i guess my philosophy on youth development and stuff right and for me my philosophy can be summed up in three words roots not fruits and it, it lines in with kind of how we're doing things here our job as coaches is to facilitate the garden, you know, is to facilitate the conditions for optimal growth. It's not to come in and say, well, we got to harvest X amount. It's to come in and say, well, are we doing a good job that the plants are growing and are going to be sustainable over the long term? So right. my job is a gardener and I just got to create the optimal conditions so that all of my players will get to where they need to get to. Um, right. I think that's a so great, that's like, I always tell people when you plant a tree, it's not for you. It's for future generations. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like, I put yep. a go out in my front yard and put a seed in and plant a tree. I'm it's not for me. It's for my kids and my kids, kids. Cause yeah. you know, it, well, it's just going to grow, but it's not going to grow to where, you know? Um, so I think yeah. that's a great, I think that's a great thing for like us as coaches too. You know, we're not going to see the 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 reaps of all our our stuff. It's like as a teacher, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just trying to make the world a little bit better. And then, yeah, I think that's great. No, that's 100 percent it. Because you you do you just want to leave the world a little bit better than you found it, and right that like that makes so much of a difference, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, There's your meaning of life, uh, kiddos. There's your meaning of life, kiddos. They always ask. Me yeah, and I, I think it's it's really interesting because uh, you know. Um, a lot of people forget about that. They don't, um, you know, they don't, they, they kind of want results and they kind of want wins. And in terms of youth. Hey, like go back to that last screen. Cause number one is a big kicker for me. Um, before we go but, on, I, here's something that you can use that I always use with my youth coaches is I go, you yeah. do not want to be a kid's last coach. Like, that, oh, should nice. your, <laughs> that should be your, that should be your goal in life. And they go, what do you mean? I go, that means they quit. Like now, if you're if you're a high school coach, I might be the kid's last coach just because they might not be good enough to play anymore. But under the yeah. age of 13, you should never be a kid's last coach. Like, because they're playing soccer, baseball, like whatever. And if they give it up, if they give soccer up because they're and they're nine because of you, then that's a problem. Like they shouldn't give up soccer Agreed. when you're nine. You should be playing as many sports as you can because you don't know what you want. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I just, I, that's I, something no, I just have pounded into my youth program. Do not be this yeah. kid's last basketball coach. I don't care what. I you like mean. that. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to use that. Yeah, you, um, you can, you can steal that. Yeah, um, and it, it's kind of something I say to to the coaches I work with. It's like, what impact are we having on these kids? And um, I spell impact a little bit different with the double T at no, the that's end. All right. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you right here. So the way I look at it is, we've got seven. I guess, skill sets. And as coaches, we want to, you know, impart intelligence skills, mental skills, psychological, athletic, communication, technical, tactical. Uh, for me, just going back to what we talked about, we've no idea where a kid's going to end up. If he quits soccer because he wants to go play basketball, if he quits basketball because he wants to go play volleyball, whether he's going to decide or he or she's going to decide, I want to be a doctor, or you know what, I just want to play recreationally, whatever it might be. So with these skills, the first five are transferable skills. The technical and tactical skills are only applicable to basketball. Right. So if a kid decides to move on, then, well, as a coach, what have you done for him or her? So intelligence is kind of, I look at it and say that, well, that's creativity, that's problem solving, critical thinking, decision making. Those are those skills. Mental, your confidence, your commitment, your competitiveness, your composure. 
Why? Right? So those are skills that need, I mean, we can say they're life skills, but those are, that's kind of how I break them down. Right. Psychological skills is your leadership, your emotional intelligence, your empathetic skills. Right? So again, life skills, athletic, your speed, agility, your coordination, your balance, all the regular stuff, um, athletic skills, communication. And I think this is huge. I mean, especially in today's world, uh, body language, verbal, nonverbal, tone of voice, dealing with confrontation, managing conflict, you know, uh, we could go down a rabbit hole with just communication skills. And the way I look at it is like, well, when I'm in a practice setting, am I just giving them technical, tactical skills? Or am I, you know, adding value and making an impact and giving them skills that can be transferred to other areas of their life, whether it's school, whether it's at home, whether it's, you know, their studies, whatever it might be. So that's kind of how I look at it. And that's what I mean about roots, not fruits. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm being deliberate in, in sharing and facilitating their growth in more than just one way. Right. I think it's, I, I, yeah, that's what I say. I, I'm, yeah, it's the teacher in me. So I've been a teacher for 30 years. I'm just, I, my, the, the court is just another classroom for me. And that, and, yeah. and everything I do, I want to do those first five. That's awesome. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, personal values as a coach, I think you need to know what you stand for. And, you know, once you know what you stand for, you'll know what is your DNA, which is your do not alter. So you're staying with it, you know? Um, and for me, those are it growth mindset. So I'm always trying to learn as a youth coach, you got to know what it is contribution, trying to give back, trying to serve others, being tough, which basically means being persistent. And yeah, I, you know, I like what I like for toughness is I like grit and I yeah. like grit because grit is the combination of passion and perseverance. Yeah. So, because I, I don't know if I was, li I don't remember who I was listening to. I listen to a lot of podcasts, but um, and obviously, because I do three podcasts, but I listen to a lot of them too. But uh, someone was talking about if you have passion towards something, it's not work. Like, I don't really want to empty the dishwasher. I don't like emptying the dishwasher. There's no part of me that wants to do it. So I procrastinate. And I don't do it. But things I like to do like this, I can get up. The things that I want to do. So you got to find that passion and perseverance. Um, and that's where going back to what we were talking about before the age of 13, we need to let them find their passion. Like if we, if we shut the door, you never know at nine, they might not like basketball, but 11, they might, you don't, they're yeah. still trying to figure out the world and you know, whether mom yeah. and dad are going to yell at them, let alone, you know, I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Like you said, even, even if a kid quits basketball for whatever reason at nine, but it was a positive, enjoyable experience, right. there's a chance he'll come back to it or she'll come back to it. So, right. you know, you, like you said, you don't want to be shutting the door. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then, I mean, obviously for me, my last uh, value is being honest, it's integrity, doing the right thing and just figuring out ways to do the right thing, which um, coming back to what we just talked about, like dishwasher and podcast, well, kids don't need to be motivated to play video games. Well, then like, so that's, why is that? And I'll try and learn and see why. And you've got, what was it? Fortnite. All of a sudden, every kid wants to play Fortnite, including NBA players. Well, what is it about that that gets kids staying up till 4 a.m. playing? Right. But we can't get them in the gym. So I think we can learn a little bit from that. And kind of what I kind of observed was the fact that, you know, they've got autonomy, they've got freedom, they can choose when to play, they're, they can uh, achieve competence. I mean, they start at an easy level and move up and they get a chance to play with their friends. Uh, but there's no standing around. There's no coaching interruptions. There's no standing on, you know, and, and they have that freedom. So I think we can learn from that by just kind of, you know, facilitating some of those skills, those uh, attributes, the autonomy, the dopamine hits, the, the freedom levels and bringing it into uh, sport. Now, not too much because obviously we are teaching discipline. We are teaching all the other stuff, but understanding that they are kids. Hey, go and... back to that. Go back to that previous one. So, yeah. so why do they do it? Um, so, I, I, let's talk about how, how we can take the bas the video game stuff and use it in basketball. I love that. Like I, I 100%, I've never thought of this and that's why, I didn't, that's why I had you go back. Cause this intrigues me. It, it, it's yeah, no, true. So I'll, I'll jump on it and say just quick segue and come back into this. Um, so if a kid for whatever reason shows up at one of our pro games, so we've got these school nights so where kids from school is getting free. So this kid has never played basketball nine or 10. He comes in 
and he watches the game. And he sees our guys, you know, shooting threes, coming in and dunking it. And it's exciting. The atmosphere is going crazy. People are shouting and, you know, the European atmosphere, it's crazy. So now he decides he wants to come play basketball. And then he joins a practice setting and the coach puts him in lines and is talking to them and telling them the entire time. And the last five minutes, the kid gets to play. Well, we hooked him with the pro game that he watched and now we're losing him. So for me, learning from video games is hook them and then keep them. So what we want to do is, especially early on when kids joining or the younger ages, we want to have a lot of games. And we can facilitate some of these skills through games. Um, Michael McKay, Canada Basketball, he calls it hiding the, the spaghetti in the meatballs. I'm going to butcher that. but No, I know what you're saying. It's like you hire, no, you, you hide like the broccoli inside the spaghetti or something. Exactly. Something they yeah, don't want exactly. to eat. They don't want to eat their vegetables. They want to, right. they want to eat their or, – or even a better one would be put your peas inside your brownie kind of thing because they want the brownie. They don't want yes. the peas. Yeah, yeah, yes. I agree. So we can do that uh, through, facil- you know, doing a lot of games. Uh, we allow children to experiment and fail without fear of criticism. So uh, I've, I've noticed this about Spanish basketball. They actually encourage mistakes, and that's something I've tried to embrace. I want my guys coming in and being ready to make at least two or three mistakes. I so, tell, so I always use the analogy with this when I, I – we didn't have basketball camp this year, obviously, but um, I say uh, it's a growth mindset is where it's coming from. But it's more like um, – I said, I live about three miles from the school. I go, okay, I live here. Do you think I can dribble this basketball home? And they all look at me like, well, yeah, probably. I go, I bet I can too. Am I a better dribbler when I do that? And they'll say, well, no, you just, I go, yeah, because I haven't, I haven't pushed my threshold. So I say, when we're doing all these drills at camp, I said, I want the ball bouncing all over because that means you're going to the window where you're not in the comfort zone. I said, I could literally walk and dribble basketball for 50, 15 miles until I got tired walking, not dribbling. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not going to be a better dribbler because of that, because I haven't pushed. I want to push to the point of making mistakes and we clap for mistakes and stuff. I mean that I want that. And I think that's yeah. what you're, that's what you're talking about. I love that. I love yeah. That. I mean, mistakes are good. Yeah. Um, and then with it, we'll try and give the kids some freedom of choice, whether it's, you know, what games we play at practice sometimes. And with the older kids, we'll let them choose what jerseys we wear. I mean, we've got, uh, fortunately, we've got a couple of, you know, different colors. Uh, if we're on the road, we'll let them choose where to eat. You know, and sometimes it's McDonald's and obviously it's not healthy. But if we're facilitating that autonomy, first we'll give right. them the freedom. Then we'll develop the mindset, you know, we're not going to do it every day. But then we'll, you know, is this healthy? And then we can facilitate a conversation out of that right um we want to evaluate and show each child the progress they're making so that's huge for us we want to talk to the kid and make sure they understand it's about them and obviously different kids will be at different levels in terms of that conversation but we want to show each kid that we care about you as an individual and this is the progress you're making and here's how we can move to the next place and um and all of that comes down to you know creating a safe environment where they feel that they're loved they feel that they're engaged and they're constantly playing. That's right. kind of what we try and do. Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, this just kind of summarizes what we yep. just talked about. But yeah. that last line, the more kids, the more that kids enjoy themselves, the more they'll play. The more they play, the better they'll play. The better they play, the harder they will work. So that's kind of um, – I'm flying through this, but there's no, a tree I love in China. This. this is like you know, long – this is going back to our tree analogy. So, yeah. yeah. So Chinese bamboo, there's no growth in the first four years. It doesn't break the ground. Then in the next five weeks, it grows 80 feet plus. So that's just saying that, you know, even the first four years, even though it doesn't break the ground, farmers are still watering it. They're taking care of it. And then boom, all of a sudden, you know, there's growth. So we might not see results. Um, And that's all right. We might not see wins. We might not see outcomes. And that's okay. Let's keep facilitating. Let's keep developing our kids. Um, just different analogy protein but you know it's the same thing uh you can't consume all the protein in the world you got to give the body the right amount of protein otherwise it's wasted so as a coach we don't want to give all the information we want to give them what they need to grow um i mean parent meetings we can like we don't need to talk about that (laughs) we we, we could do we could do a six-hour podcast on parent meetings yes yeah and and number five Um, is no uh, i think it's number five um I think, and I'm just just because people are going to be listening. I think the key to parent meetings is, or pa- parents, 
is over communicate, over communicate, over communicate, over communicate, over communicate. Yeah. Like they just want to know what's going on. Most of them. Um, most that's of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, like just briefly, even parents care about their kids as much as us as coaches. They might not have the right information. They might not see the bigger picture. We care about them. so, but they do care about their kids, and they they definitely want success for their child. And then it's up to us to communicate how we're going to help them achieve that. So it's they're not the bad guys. I mean, no. sometimes they might act like it, but they're not the bad guys. Right. And sometimes you can't be rational with irrational people either. So I always tell yes. people that. <laughs> So don't take it personally. That's what I tell my, I tell the coaches, I said, I have my nephew here. Who's like, who's like um, seven. And I have my nephew visiting who's seven and two. And my daughter's like getting upset. I go, Emma, stop. You can't be rational with an irrational. They're not rash. He's not right. He's yeah. tired. He's not rational. Just let him go. He's like, you yeah. know, don't take it personal. It's just not, that's just what it is. But yeah. Yeah. Parents are very I mean, similar like, to a seven year old at times. They need uh, to have it's, yeah. Well, you're right in saying that. I mean, if a kid is throwing a tantrum, you're not highly going to rationalize it with them. It's, you just let them have the tantrum. It's the same thing with parents. Yeah. I've let more than a handful of parents just vent at me. And it's like, uh huh. I, I, they just want to be heard too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of developing youth. I mean, we're going through this. Yeah, this is great. Team meetings. Um, so in a, in a, in a, Preseason team meeting will introduce the staff, talk about logistics. We will discuss core values. That's really important for the teams to understand. We talk about standards. If it's an under 14 team plus, we'll probably let them, you know, come up with their own because once they, you know, if they come up with it, they're probably going to buy in a lot more. We talk about expectations. You know, we discuss rotations. If we have 20 players, how are we going to deal with it? If we have 12 players, how are we going to deal with it? We talk about communication policy. Like if you're not going to show up at practice, how, when, early, you should communicate that to coaches. We talk about, you know, events that are coming up, what the dress codes are, travel details, you know, playing philosophy, identity, roles. And I think the roles is huge because anytime somebody does not know what you expect from them, they're, they're not sure where they fit in in your plan, in the team, in the system, they don't know where they're going. So roles is huge. Really. And roles is uh, for, for me, even in, it, I, I think roles are important in the beginning of the season. I think roles are important mid season, sometimes twice during the season. They're yeah. important after the season to help them move forward. I think all of that is important before we do that, but because I want to talk about number one is how do you yeah. go about hiring? What's your standard for hiring and how do you do that? Okay. Coaches. So with the, with with this program, it's 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 very different with Swans, where there's two professional coaches in the club, and that's myself and our Bundesliga pro coach, and okay. everybody else is a volunteer. So that hiring process of coaching is, you know, so we try and obviously look at players who are coming to the end of their careers, or players who've stopped playing for a while, have kids. We look at teachers in the schools we communicate with them our vision. At least this is what we're doing this season. We're communicating with them. This is our vision. This is where we want to go. This is our player pathway. This is how we're going to develop players. This is what we stand for. Would you be interested in coming in and helping us out? So we're trying to cast a wide net at parents, at volunteers, at school teachers, former players, current players who are coming to the end of their career just to try and get some. Because actually just between, you know, obviously it's on a podcast, we're not sure if we have enough coaches for next season. And if we're not sure if we have enough coaches for next season, then we can't be picky. But what we can do is once we've hired coaches or brought in coaches, we need to develop and invest in them. And my philosophy as well is the, the number one thing we need to do for player development is develop your coaches. I agree. So, I agree. Um, I think people don't so, do that. I think people spend a lot of time on all the stuff we're talking about yeah. and don't spend as much time. I mean, the world is run by people at this point. Yeah. AI hasn't taken over yet. So yeah. uh, I'm just saying, I think you got to invest in, I mean, all the, all the back, all the um, behind the scenes stuff is important to put on yeah. the musical Hamilton. I get it. But what's really important is the people singing the songs out in the front. So yeah. um, you've got to invest in them. Um, if as much, if not more than what's behind the scenes, I agree. Um, I think people forget that a lot of coaches forget youth coaches. Forget oh, no, that, that's huge for us. I mean, we are trying to make sure that we're deliberate in terms of how we develop our coaches. We've actually done something this season, the season that's coming. We obviously have our national governing bodies, coaching qualification. You know, you've got your A license, B license, C license. 
but we're developing an in-house coaching pathway so that our coaches coming in have are here and this is kind of what we need you to learn here but as we go through over the years we're going to help you get to the next stage as we define coaching development um so i don't know if that's a good thing or not but we definitely want to develop our coaches that's huge for us right. um, yeah so uh I'll, I'll tell you one thing though um i i was a couple of years ago i went for an interview uh with a basketball academy in england uh kent crusaders and they had by far the, the best coaching hiring process that I'd seen. I'm not sure if they still do this. They flew me in and what they had me do is do a technical, teach a technical skill session with actual, you know, their players. Uh, it was a 45 minute. Then they had me teach a separate tactical skill session. Then they had me give film breakdown to their players. And then we had an, a, an interview with myself and four of their members. And I thought from a professionalism or from a holistic point of view to see how, all right, how does he coach? What does he coach? How does he do this? You know, I thought it was really good, cool that they, they went through the full spectrum. It's not just, all right, here's a resume. Here's what we do. No, they went through the full spectrum, which I thought was really cool. Right. Um, oh, I think that's like, yeah, because you're becoming part of a family per se. You want to make sure you're, before you let them in. Yeah, I love that. And you got to keep the standards and culture up. So yeah. that's, yeah. Um, practice planning. I, I guess we're in a stage right now where most coaches will, I'm not sure if most, but most coaches that I've worked with here will tell you that they've got a practice plan in their head. I'm the type of person that I want something on paper. I need something to be able to see and reflect on. So I think practice planning, there's a couple of things that I try and do. Pre-practice thoughts, which kind of remind me of where I'm at. Mind candy, which translates to the, life skills i try and highlight a point of emphasis that we're doing um so a point of emphasis terms. is like we're going to work on boxing out we're going to work on crashing the board yeah okay yeah okay we're going to have two emphasis for the day and we'll try and you know so all our drills all our games are going to have like this is our emphasis we got to make sure we do this right um, okay uh daily drills so i'll pick uh, i'll just see if i can do well, what about here. power of terms is that like oh. definitions that you need to talk about that's almost like so I've seen coaches explain the drill every single time they do it. Well, no, if we say, I mean, if we say we're going to do a uh, 3v3 cutthroat, the guys should know by the third time what it is. So we're not explaining it. And this allows the guys to get into it really quickly. Yeah. So, have to explain, yeah, I just did, I just did a thing about like um, a podcast about the three keys to a good practice are time. Cause I like to be, you know, I, I hate long practices if you don't need them. Mm -hmm. Pace. How, how quickly you move from one thing to the next and flow. Um, yeah. I think those three things, but I do, I, what I've done recently is I, I, I do my talk and walks or walk and talks, whichever way you want to talk about it, it early in practice, before practice starts. Like, so I hate, I hate taking, I hate messing the flow of a practice and explaining the three by three drill. Like we did it at the beginning. If you don't know, step off and ask a friend because the ones that were getting it and it helps, because think about the flow of a basketball game, right? The flow of a basketball game is just, it's constant. It's not like, did, 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 did. it's not stop, yeah. stop, stop. Um, and I try to use the 90, 10 rule where they're doing stuff 90% and I'm coaching 10. Like when we're doing drills and stuff, because here's my theory with the 90, 10, if I put it at 90, 10, I'm going to actually end up at 80, 20, which, yeah, I, yeah. which <laughs> I can, which I can live with. I can live with 80, yeah. 20, but I don't want me stopping a drill and saying something 30 seconds later stop the drill another person jumps in it messes the flow and the pace um and p pace does effort effort to you know it, it there's this correlation that goes all the way through um yeah but I, I love that i love power turn i love getting that power terms or the walk or the talk out fast like get it out of the way 100 really. percent. yeah I, I think your point about flow is 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 on point because yeah i've seen i've seen it that you know, either long-term coaches or new coaches, they will want to explain everything. They want to be involved. And the nine to 10, I like it because it's like, you have to remove yourself. Right. Plus, if you remove yourself, they will communicate to each other. Now you're developing yeah. communication and leadership. So, right. No, I love that. Okay, so keep going through these because this really intrigues me because this is what I've been, I've been doing deep dives on practice planning over the next, last couple months. So. so daily drills, those are the kind of stuff. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, maybe I can't. Um, 
I'll, if, you have, if you have that practice thing, I'll have you send that too, because then they can cool. zoom in and look at it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll have a list of uh, about 10 to 12 daily drills that I want to do. Now, I'll pick three or four of these to do in the practice session. I will not go through all of them. But right. these are things I want to do every, every practice to emphasize or our standard or our culture or our identity, whichever way you want to call it. So if last season we'll go, for example, we're a transition defensive team, well, I want to do a transition defense or segment at some stage and really focus. So I'll pick from these drills, which always highlight our identity. So okay. it makes it easier for me. Quick sets. Um, this will, uh, you might like it if you haven't heard of it. We start our practice with quick sets, which basically means I'll come in and say, guys, we're going to do layups. And here's the two points of emphasis. Uh, you got to make a one hand pass or you got to finish with an inside hand finish. And we're only going to do it for 90 seconds and I'll step out. I'll let them go. So, if they do it right for 90 seconds, we're done. However, if they mess up, all I'm doing is saying reset and the clock resets. And I'm quiet. Reset, the clock resets. So we will go until they get it right for 90 seconds. And essentially what we're trying to do is get the guys to focus at the very start of practice. If we can't get that simple part right, that you have to make a pass with a, you know, one hand or an outside hand, or you can't finish with your inside hand, or at least try, we're not saying make the finish, and if you can't focus at that stage, well, we're not going to go halfway through the practice and then have problems saying you guys are not focused because we've right. done it at the start. Um, and the other thing is after a couple of times, players will start holding each other accountable. So you don't have to. You don't have to do that. Um, what it, go, back to, go back to six. How do you do impact situations? Oh, is that something you talk about? Yeah, I'll have it here in, uh, in, in this point here. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, yeah. So if I'm doing a drill, I'll have it here and I'll just have an IMP or whatever. So if it's an A, for example, I'll make sure that I tell one of the players, look, we're trying to focus on coordination here. Just keep an eye on your teammates, okay. give them some feedback. Okay. If it's psychological, I'll do that. So, um, okay. But it helps me stay on point. Okay. Progressions, regressions, really it's to make sure I have something. If it's too easy, I got to have something to go advance. If it's too hard, I got to have something to go lower. And I'll have this sometimes for individual players, especially if it's a individual stuff. Um, so maybe Mike can't do everything at the same level. So I'm going right. to have something for him. Teams, I'm going to have my teams kind of laid out here, my 3v3 teams, 4v4 teams, 5v5 teams. So then I'm ready to go yeah. and they know black, white, rever you know, I don't need to. I love like that. Said, flow. I love that because Thank again, you. it's flow and pace. If you're stopping to match guys, I, yeah, I love that. I love having all my, for the entire practice, I have all my groups done. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which, which just makes sense. You want to keep things moving. Um, Post-practice thoughts. So at the end of practice, what I'll do is I'll take 15 minutes and I'll reflect on the practice, write down anything that I think is relevant. Um, Mike had a bad practice. Well, why did he have a bad practice? What can I do differently to facilitate that next time? This drill worked. That game didn't. Well, it's not only it did and it didn't. Why did it do it? Did I move too quickly? Did I explain things right? So I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on the practice. In my post-practice, um, that's my drive home. So, oh, okay. so here's how I do it. So I, for other coaches that are listening, here's how I do it is I turn off the music. I turn off, it's, it's just me and the car and driving because then my, I, I kind of get all the clarity of the chaos of the day out and I can mm -hmm. reflect on that. You know, it's what, I don't know, 10 minute drive and I can just reflect on. And then when I pull into the driveway or the garage is when I pull my thing out then and I'll go, we need to do this. We need, because it's almost like the fog of battle too much right after practice for me. Okay. Um, I will jot stuff in that during, during practice, I'll jot stuff down too. Like, Oh crud, we need to work on our, on our help site or our, our pack line or whatever it is. Yeah. And so then I, when I look at the practice plan and I'm doing the next one, I'll do that. But I'll also, I, I like that. Like it's almost a meditation thing for me. It's just something that people could think about, but it's, it's a, it's, I love the post. You got to think about it. Um, yeah. You can't wait a day because it will go away unless you're going to go back. To I, I think I think you got to do it. Um, yeah. At the same day. Now, just a quick question for you. Your practices finishes about 5 p.m. Yeah, it depends if we have early. It's like 530 or if we're late, it will be like 730. Um, OK, I tend uh, to do my practice planning and I've asked tons of coaches. I tend to do my practice planning in the morning um, uh -huh. the day of. So I'll wake up earlier and do it. Uh, yeah. and the reason I do that is, um, I want to kind of leave, I am done with practice. I want to leave it. 
and I yeah. know I'm thinking about it. Like I know I'm dreaming yeah. about it. I know I'm thinking about it subconsciously. I yeah. know there's the wheels are turning, even though I'm not like after this 10 minutes, not like sitting down and thinking about it. Gotcha. Um, because then it's the, it's like a brain dump the next morning for me, yeah. you know, a cup of coffee, silence in the house, poof brain dump you know um, so i got a question for you and i don't wonder if you you know your european coaches have, have weighed in on this one of the reasons why i do it straight after practice is well i guess most of the european clubs would finish practice at about 9 p.m sometimes 10 p.m <laughs> and all i want to do is get home and spend time with my kid or right. my wife right so i don't want to you know so i wonder if, if from your guests the european coaches would they do it you know 15 minutes later would they do it straight after i, I don't know if that's something you. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put something in the, yeah. I'll put my email in the show notes. And if they want to email me, that'd be interesting. Yeah. To know. Um, that's uh, late. Holy cow. You guys, eat, yeah, because you guys do everything late in Europe anyway. You eat late. Well, one of the things is because uh, you've got like the basketball in the States is uh, a school or college. So, right. like, and, and we're more club based. So, kids got to finish school and college before they come. And that's right. a little bit different, I guess. It's yeah, but it's not ideal. No. Yeah, and I'll and I'll and I'll get that. I'll I'll get the form there too. I'm always looking for forms, and that would be great. Maybe they can look at those drills. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so um, you know, this is tweets. You talk about flow. Well, I want to coach in tweets. I don't want to stop and explain things. However, at times I want to, I guess, get a player to come to the answer himself, uh, which means I can't give him the information. So generally, I'll do it. In the middle of a game, I'll take, I'll sub one player out and talk to them really quickly and try and tease out the answer, or I'll do it at the end during a review of feedback segment. But right. in the flow of the game, I want to coach in tweets. Let, let yeah, it's, uh, it's Snapchat. I love it. It's like little snippets. It's quick. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, empowering players. Uh, this is that, you know, we're building self esteem, we're building confidence, we're building autonomy. So I'll let players, you know, choose a drill or game depending on you know, where they are, if I think they deserve that opportunity, I'll offer them opportunities to provide feedback, offer suggestions to improve. Like, this is something that they've really taken on last season because two years ago was my first season here and they thought I was crazy. Just to give you an idea, I've come from coaching Ireland, UK, States to Austria. Austria is made up of Serbians, Bosnians, Germans, Eastern Europeans, Croatians, and if I'm not Ezelko Obradovic, if I'm not yelling at these guys, they think I'm soft. They think, oh, well, coach doesn't know what he's doing. So my style of coaching has taken about a season and a half, two seasons for them to understand, wait, he's a different style of coach. Um, so a lot of this stuff has taken me a while to even get where we've had that same level of respect and they understand what I'm doing. Right. But last season, they started to offer suggestions without feeling like I was going to chew them out for offering feedback um and we'll have them you know they can have an input on t-shirt design and stuff like that um, right. so, so that's kind of how we try and empower our players here um uh, managing success so yeah goldilocks it's not too cold it's not too hot it's just right that's got to be with our drills can't be too hard can't be too easy uh we want to try and get them to about 60 75 percent success if they keep failing all the time they're going to get bored. They're going to quit. They're going to get frustrated. If they keep winning all the time, they're going to, you know, get bored again. So we try and manage it that way. Uh, reflection we just talked about. Um, this is just kind of how we try and get our coaches to develop self-awareness. Which um, is hard. It's harder for the coaches, I think, sometimes than the players. Yeah. I, think, I, like I, said, I love journaling. I love journaling. I think that's great. It, it, it requires a lot of self-discipline. I think for the coaches and sometimes we're not that good at it, but journaling, that's, you know, it, it's a huge self-discipline. You got to be disciplined to do that. Um, and, and all of these, I think can help you. Like you said, yours on the drive home where you almost kind of use that time. Well, I wonder how many coaches genuinely do that, especially in the early phases of their coaching career, right. you know, and that's something that can really help. Um, I try and question everything I do. Like, why did I do it? How can I do it better? You know, uh, what can I do to change? So if I had an interaction with a player that did not go as planned, well, it's not his problem. It's my problem because right. I'm the one who I can change myself. I can't. And by changing myself, I might be able to impact him. Um, we try and do the same with our players. Last season, actually, we had all our players under 19, actually, 
uh, write a match review after every game. And in that match review, they highlighted what went well, uh, what can we improve on for themselves, for the team, and for the coach. And this is what I mean about, um, I guess, putting myself out there. It was very difficult at the start of the season for them to write, well, coach, you know, you need to manage the timeouts better. Or coach, you need to manage the substitutions better. But towards the end of the season, where we're, you know, we're opening up a little bit more, and then they can tell me, coach, you didn't do a good job here, which allows me to get to know their thoughts, and we can have a conversation about that. And I can understand where they're coming from. They can understand where I'm coming from. So we're moving on together, which stops them from backbiting in the locker rooms and saying, well, coach doesn't have a clue what he's doing. You know? Right. So, um, so that's kind of uh, also, you know, uh, it allows them to develop their critical thinking skills. So that's just self-awareness developing in coaches and players. Uh, enhancing performance. You mentioned this early on. You said something about pushing yourself to, your, to, to um, the edge of your comfort zone. Well, in any racing engine, the nearer you are to disintegrating it, the better the performance will be. And that's Formula One, whatever. You, you want to push yourself to the extreme. Right. Um, to, the point, to the point of breaking. Yes. Exactly. Um, and I'll look at it and I'll say, for my players, well, the composure is one. So the engine temperature, I'll look at it, is that's the player's composure. They got to be at the ideal state. Um, a Russell Westbrook plays at about a nine or a 10. He's all out. A Steph Curry, probably lower. I got to know for each of my players what their ideal performance state is. Um, and then if they're not there, then I need to know how to get them there. Um, the next, the tachometer for me is the motivation levels. The more motivated a player is, the harder he'll work. So I want to make sure that they're motivated to the point to the, where they're redlining it, but not over-motivated where they start going crazy on the court. Uh, then obviously looking at their confidence, how confident they are. The more confident they are, the better the performance will be. Unless they redline it, then it's overconfident, cocky, and that's a problem. And then the last thing is the fuel gauge, so body fuel. So as a coach, I'm looking at all these things when my players walk in the gym and saying, well, what can I do to change that? What can I do to keep it where it is? And how can I continue? to evaluate and that's not easy no it's not and in dealing with composure motivation levels confidence and and how their bodies are i mean that is that and those are and and sometimes what i what i always think is sometimes one level is going up and the other one's going down like it just like yeah. they had a crappy lunch but they're being really motivated today or you know yeah. it's like it's when you can get them all in balance that's the perfect yes i agree yes so uh, that's kind of what we look at in terms of enhancing performance. These are just some tips and kind of how we do it. Um, closing thoughts, we're just kind of, I guess, coming up to, I guess, the end. Um, when you permit habits, you promote them. When you allow behaviors, you encourage them. When you condone actions, you own them. And when you tolerate average, you deserve average. And that's something I've kind of mm -hmm. kept in, in the back of my mind with how we do things. And um, It's not only basketball related, it's life related. So, No, I um, think that's great, coach. So, so that's kind of my closing thought really yep. there. Perfect. Um, and I'll so leave, the, I'll leave your contact stuff in there so they can get a hold of you. Cool. It looks like Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. And you have like 85 digits on your phone number there. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I'm not used to that. I know it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's not like an area code, like 414 or, you know, 213 <laughs> or whatever it is. It's like, yeah. I'm never sure why they put the plus in front. Why do you put the plus in front of their phone numbers? That's a country code. So if, we're, if I was going to call the States, I got to put a plus one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get to the States. Uh, or, um, either, either a plus one or a zero, zero, one. So then I can get to the right country. Um, so the plus 43 is the country code. Yeah. So 43 is Austria and 353 is Ireland. Uh, so I got two numbers uh okay now, see i learned something today that's awesome all right um there you go. okay uh all right so let's stop sharing the screen so i can see you um okay and all right perfect and then let's i have some i have some questions for you um so there we go um what is uh what is what is the easiest part about what you the move and what's been the hardest part about the move because, I mean, I'm sure there's um, lots of people in the States listening to this and they're thinking, okay, that's a long ways from home. And, that, you know, it's like. The, the easiest part, I guess, is I enjoy doing what I do. 
um, I'm really passionate. And the club over here has given me the freedom. They're not micromanaging me, which I think is huge. They're not trying to micromanage me. Yes, I've listened. I've talked to other club coaches. They micro so a lot of some of them micromanage. Yes, it's yeah, it's it's not a good situation uh, to be micromanaged at all. So, uh, so that's they're very supportive of what I do, and I think especially me being Irish and them having you know them having a mindset of how they should do things and them letting me do that. Um, so that's been really easy. My wife really supportive of what I do. Um, I, I noticed that um, uh, frame behind you. We interrupt uh, this marriage for basketball season. You know, my wife, your wife, the MVPs. I mean, we wouldn't oh, be what we're doing so without them. And um, she's been really supportive of this. And uh, yeah, so that's been the easy part, I guess. Okay. What's the hard part? Um, hard part is, uh, you know, packing up and you don't have as a coach you're not sure if your safety security like previous programs it didn't work out you're packing your bag so my first season here it was like all right let's not decorate the house because i don't know how long we're going to last here um so obviously from my wife's perspective it's like well i can't put you know frames up i can't do this and you know that's always in the back of your mind well if we don't get the results if we don't get the success criteria ticked off well we might be moving soon right yeah uh, so that's quite difficult um not getting results early on i mean i didn't get results early on um and at the back of my mind it's, i guess that was really tough for me until the management brought me in and said you look like you're worried and i was like yeah for sure and they're like we're not worried about wins just keep doing what you're doing which was a huge load off on my shoulders because um right. but that was difficult early on and then de dealing with a different culture for me, it's like, it's the first time I'm coaching in a place where they don't speak English as a first language. Um, so I'm learning what's the German. First, what's right the now. first language? German. So if I'm coaching under 19s, well, we don't understand each other. Well, if I'm coaching under 11s, well, we're speaking two completely different languages. And so, yeah, the first two seasons were really tough. Um, I had an assistant coach and I'll tell him, all right, tell the guys to pass and cut, pass and cut. And he'll spend five minutes translating that. I'm like, pass and cut. You know, that's not five minutes. So really trying to get the coaches to understand my line of thinking, but communicating to them in a way that they get it, which is difficult because they don't speak English too. It's not only the kids who don't speak, the adults aren't really uh, English speakers. So that's been really difficult. Well, that's, um, that surprises me that, that, that they don't learn English. I mean, it seems like most of Europe speaks English. Not that they should. I'm just saying it seems like it's a universal language. Germans and Austrians, in my experience, are very proud, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Yep. They want to keep their heritage. They want to keep um, uh, their language. They, they, so I find it positive and I find it really frustrating and negative. I'll give you a quick story. Uh, I was driving in Germany uh, first season here and I got lost. And, well, you know, I got to stop and ask the cops to point me in the right direction. They would not speak English to me but they could understand me. So they knew what I was saying, but they responded in German. I'm like, I'm totally lost here. Point me in the right direction. No, so it's, um, so that was, you know, I guess an eye opener to the culture. Now my wife is German, so she speaks German. So that obviously helps me out a little bit, but um, yeah. Oh God, they're, that they're helps proud. a lot. That helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, she she um she reads all the letters and all the documents that comes in, and because everything's German. Um, but yeah, so it's it's it, it, it's the 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 proudness or the pridefulness is a good thing and a bad thing, and depends how you look at it. Um, I I know I, that's that's that, that I was going to ask that that was actually on my list. What um what's your biggest challenge as a coach? Um, the weight that I put on my shoulder, the the I feel like. I can be better. I feel like I'm not at my best. I feel like I can do more. That's always bugging me that I can, I can always do more. I can, I want, I guess, you know, as a coach, we want to do, we want to achieve what we know we can, but we right. want to do it now, but we understand it's a process and we need to be patient, but we know we can do it now if we just like did it. So I got to trust and I got to trust my assistant coaches to do something, which takes me about three seconds to do, which, take them two weeks to do but right. i know it's part of the process to get them there so 
Uh, it's a lot of pressure that I put on my own shoulders, nobody else. Um, that, yeah, so that's the challenge that I got to be patient and I got to trust others and be a better leader for coaches more so do the, than players. Do the top people in the club speak English? Like when, they, when, the, when your bosses call you in, do they talk in English to you? My GM speaks in English. However, any meetings, group meetings with coaching staff or board members, it's all German. But my GM will speak to me in English. And uh, during these meetings, he will translate or he will try and translate um, in any breaks he gets. But yeah, the board members and, you know, when we have like uh, club meetings and stuff like that, they'll speak German. So do you pull out a phone and have a translator in your phone and then plug it in your ear? My, my very first meeting here, I got here, uh, we had 57 guys in the meeting and they introduced me and they wanted me to talk and they didn't speak English. And I was like, with my Google Translate, I'm like, you know, trying to, trying to get all the information in, which was, yeah. So I, I did that last season. Uh, this season, well, the second season, I've become so much better at my German, so I don't need to. I just ask them to speak slowly and I can understand more. So. But okay. my first season, yeah, I was. So you need to take awesome. Rietta Stone or something. You need to, you need a crash course <laughs> in German. <laughs> I did. I went. I went to school my first season. I went to. Um, I actually enrolled myself into school and did like a, a German course uh, because trying to learn from home and going into school and learning is two different things. So, um, but that was a good decision that I went into school to learn German. Right, because so there's dialects too. I'm guessing there's speed. There's dialects. There's all. Yeah, like oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what's the hardest thing to teach? What's the hardest skill? What's the hardest thing as a coach to teach? Um, that's really cool. I never, I, I haven't thought of that. What's the hardest skill to teach? I wouldn't say technical, tactical. I feel like uh, that's. I feel like the desire to learn. Uh, I'd probably put you know, I put learning as a skill. And, and oh, the I desire think so. to learn. That growth mindset yeah. is hard to teach. That, that yeah. grit is hard to teach. I agree. Um, yeah. So that would be. It. Screening is, you know, reading a screen is hard to teach too. But, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's footwork. I think footwork, and it's better probably, and maybe it's better in the Euro Europe than it is here, but footwork is something that isn't really taught in the States like it should be. Um, so just, here's a question for you, if you don't mind. Is yep. it hard to teach or is it just not taught? No, I think it's, I think it's hard. I think it's like, I think it's hard to teach. I think the, the minuscule parts of footwork uh -huh. is, is a hard kind. I mean, it's much harder. First of all, I don't think they correlate the advantage of it. So it's harder to, for them to connect with you when you're teaching it. Um, uh -huh. It's unlike me. If I take a kid into the gym and teach them how to tweak their jump shot, they're all in because they want to be in um, even okay. rebounding, something like that. I think there, there's more buy-in. So I think the okay. footwork and that stuff, there isn't the buy-in. So you're starting at a disadvantage even before you start. And I then there is so much minute things. If you've ever watched like some of the Steph Curry, I mean, to get footwork and to get reads down is a higher level it's like it's like being a phd rather than having a master's degree or bachelor's degree you know i got you it's a higher level thing and i just i mean i don't have time to teach it at a high school level i you know, i don't see them enough to be able to do all that minuscule stuff yeah um yeah. but anyway i just think it's in, in a good footwork you're not thinking about like you're yeah, not yeah, yeah. You're, it, it, it's it's an automatic thing um and at the younger levels is when it's got to start. And it's definitely not being taught in the States. I can tell you that. Um, well, what's one thing you've learned in the last week? Oh, one. Um, I'm doing, I'm reading a book, actually. Um, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Okay. So what I've learned is more mirroring and labeling in terms of communicating, being a better communicator. I have no idea what's going on today. I it's apologize. awesome. I love, seriously, I'm not, I don't edit this out. I love that. Like people, people are going, oh, this guy lives in Sacramento. Well, no, he doesn't. So there's my, there's my proof that he doesn't <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I've read that book by Chris Voss and I, 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 he's a former FBI negotiator. So it's really, I guess that communication, I'm always getting better at communicating and it's so he highlighted or reminded me through that book that 93% uh, of our communication is nonverbal. 
So especially in, these, in this time when we're communicating by text and email, well, how do I do a better job of communicating it? Because a lot of things can be lost in translation. If 93% of our communication is nonverbal, well, how can I communicate better through WhatsApp, through email? So that's something that I guess I'm learning more and more on. Um, and it's trying to also encourage my fellow coaches to, to, learn, to learn and adapt with that. Okay. Do you have any superstitions? No. Okay. None? That was, that was quick. I can, no, I okay. got none. I, and I always, I always give the spiel. I'm, I'm a little superstitious, but superstition for me is about routine, not I don't wear the lucky socks. We're going to lose. It's more. Oh, about, okay. So, so that's so, where superstitions come from me. When I was a player, I had to put my left yeah. shoe on before my right shoe. It okay. was just because that was what I did before every game. It wasn't like if I put my right shoe on first, we we're going to lose. It was more me getting oh, okay. the mindset. That's where superstitions come from. Me. Oh, okay. Everyone thinks like, you know, now I ate 23 Big Macs in a row because we hadn't lost a game one season because I did it uh-huh. once and I kept doing it. And it wasn't <laughs> like, you know, we didn't lose because I did, I did. I mean, I kept eating it, like whatever. But it's like, it was more like, that's my routine. I'm getting ready to the game. I'm getting ready to coach. I'm putting my, I wear a tie to every game or I don't wear a tie anymore. I wear like, um, a, a suit jacket and I'm dressed up nice, but I don't wear the tie anymore because I've always found it too constraining to coach in. Um, yeah, but I, I got, I got some I routines, but uniform. I mean, I got some routines, uh, but I, I, it's not that if I don't do it, I feel like the world is ending, I guess. And that was a right. misunderstanding. Yeah. But one of the things is I got to have at least two cups of coffee before game. <laughs> Get ready. Um, I've never then, heard that one before. Holy cow. And then, Straight after the cups of coffee, I want at least 10 minutes to meditate. So what I'll do is I'll go into the stands opposite from my bench. I'll watch my team warm up and I'll get my headphones in and I'll just try and... I, I don't know if it makes sense that I'm trying to calm down just after I've had coffee, but that's what I do. Okay. I, uh, it seems counterintuitive <laughs> to have the coffee and the meditation, whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you could change one thing about the game, what would you change? I would not let the referees touch the ball after he goes out of bounds. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. It would speed up the game. I would do, I would do two things. I would get rid of the jump ball. Like to start the basket. We have, we, the throw the ball up at the beginning of the game seems silly to me. I would just start it. I would give it to the visiting team everywhere in the world. Done. And then you go alternating possession. Period. I mean, why do we throw the ball up? Now, I understand the NBA actually does jump balls, but most people don't do jump balls anymore. Yeah. So yeah, why, are we, why are we throwing the ball up to start the game? Why don't we just let – it's not like soccer where you kind of have to do it or hockey. It's like yeah. it makes no sense. There, the, so, why? Like, I understand I never, why it was in the game, but why do we do it now? That's my – I'm telling you, I'm going to start a petition. I should do that on change. It. Why do we have the jump ball to be any of a basketball game? Like, yeah, I never thought of that. And the officials are horrible at throwing it because they're not practicing. <laughs> like, when I grew up, everything was a jump ball, and they were good at throwing it because they had, like, 10, uh-huh. 10, 20 jump balls during a game. So they were good at timing it and figuring it out. They're horrible at throwing that ball up at the start of the game. Horrible. It makes sense. I'd like to see that actually. Now that you mention it. Yep. So that's gonna be. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be the guy that gets that change. That's gonna be my goal in life. I'm gonna do a podcast just on that. I would do that, and I would have a governing body that would decide what's gonna happen everywhere as far as basketball goes. Is that we're not gonna in the states? Everywhere, everywhere. Everywhere. Like one governing body, and this is the way we're gonna play the game. Not that we're going to have the European rules, not that we're going to have the NBA rules, not that we're going to have the college rules, not that we're going to have, like, we're going to have one governing body. Here's how you play it. Well, I'm going to correct you on that simply because I'm European. We don't have European rules. We've got international rules. You have international. And the states. And the states. You're right. You're right. So you guys. <laughs> You're right. We're the ones that have changed. I, I would I would 100%. NBA, high school, different three-point lines. Yeah, I would 100% agree. Um, all right, so I'm going to do my rapid fire. Okay. And Grant, Mitchell, come here, bud. Is, is, uh, hold on. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, is, is anybody up right now? 
All right, we're gonna we're, this is this is what we do. Come here, you can sit with me and we can finish the podcast. <laughs> yep. No, this is my nephew, and he just got. Hi, up. Mitchell. So say hi. hi All Mitchell. right. So here we're gonna do rapid fire. All right. So what's your favorite brand of basketball? Uh, like type of basketball you play with? Uh, Spalding. Yeah. So these are just quick questions. I ask quick questions. That's how we end. Okay. A uh, one word to describe your ideal player. Uh, aggressive. One sporting event you can go to in the world. What would it be and why? Uh, Euroleague final, just to experience the atmosphere. I've never been there. I've seen it and it's a phenomenal. I've seen it on TV. It's phenomenal. Okay. Uh, favorite pregame meal. Ooh, pasta. Okay. Uh, one skill not being taught in today's game. Um, can I, one skill that's being taught that I don't like is triple threat. So I, uh, I'd say the drop, the split stance should be taught instead of triple threat. So maybe split stance. Okay. Uh, one thing you do to relax. Uh, meditate, read books. Let's do things. Um, one coaching technique you consider important. Oh, can you define a coaching technique? No. Um, I mean, anything you do yeah. as a coach. There we go. I'll define it. Anything you do as a coach. Because <laughs> it can be mental. Like, it, it can – yeah, I got it. Connect with my players more. Um, Coach-athlete relationships. Okay. That's why I don't like answering that because I want – it can be anything. Um, okay. Best basketball player of all time. Kobe Bryant. Oh, okay. So you are, so uh, this is episode, you're going to be like episode almost 700. I think maybe Kobe's gotten one vote. Michael's gotten like 97%. So you're in the min minority. That's, that's fine. I'm just, I, that's why I paused a little bit. You even put him at a LeBron. So if LeBron's listening to this or Michael's listening, yeah, yeah you, you, we, his email will be down below. Um, <laughs> we did this. One thing that's helped you become a better basketball coach. Uh, support from others, um, especially my mentors. So uh, they really helped me out. All right. Best basketball game you've seen in person? It's one that I've coached, actually. Um, Ireland versus Israel in the European Championships. Uh, Israel went on to finish second, and they, uh, they didn't lose a game. Every game they won was 15 plus, and we took them to the final shot of the game, and we ended up losing by two. So that was the best game, man. Uh, your favorite quote? Uh, at the moment, it's adapt and thrive, especially because of the situation we're in. We got to adapt to the situation and then thrive. Um, otherwise, it's control the controllables. Ooh, I like that. Um, one word to describe your coaching style player focused. Okay, that's two words, but we'll, we'll, we'll let them have that. We won't say anything. <laughs> that's okay. I like that. Uh, we'll, uh, best basketball coach of all time? Bill Jackson. Okay, I would definitely. Um, I find that one harder than the basketball player one, to be honest with you. Maybe it's because I'm a coach. One book. You can only pick one book. What would you recommend? Atomic Habits, uh, James. Clear. Love Atomic Habits. Oh my God, you're like the third coach in the last couple of weeks. It's in 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 it's small changes. That's all it is. It's small changes. Yeah. If yeah. I can summarize the book, small changes, people. If you want to change your habits, if you want to That's get it. on the treadmill, move the treadmill where you see it every day. Don't leave it in the basement. It's this yeah. little micro changes. Um, uh, Perfect. Do you, uh, the other two questions is we've already answered. What would you tell your young yourself and what would you change about your, the game? So coach, any parting words? Um, I guess it would be just, uh, you know, thank you obviously for having me on. I appreciate well, this is it. Awesome. Uh, you know, uh, really enjoy the opportunity. Really appreciate it. So I, I, I enjoy this. Um, yeah, look, my details, you, you've got, you're going to attach them. If anybody yep, wants I will to put everything when uh, – so here's how it will work so everyone that's listening knows this. I will put this on YouTube too, so if you're listening. Um, so I just put it every – I basically put it everywhere. Um, and then I will put your stuff down below. Um, 
And if you, you know, if you don't live in Austria and you're six eleven and you got a, a, a seven, two wingspan, give coach some contact. I'm sure he'll, he'd, he'd love to look into you. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Hey coach, so glad you enjoyed that video. Not that you found us, you already found us. Let me know how I can help. Um, I've won lots of championships as you can see, won lots of rings. Uh, let me know how I can help you become a better basketball coach. Teachoops.com is one small way. Go over and check it out above and below and let me know how we can serve you become to become a better basketball coach. Enjoy.